Over the past three decades, genetic knowledge has changed dramatically. Historically, genetics has focused on Mendelian laws of inheritance, essential for understanding rare single gene disorders such as cystic fibrosis and thalassemia. But now we have entered the era of genomics, the ability to investigate a person's entire DNA sequence. It is thought that in complex diseases, such as cancer, obesity and diabetes, many genes may interact with each other and with the environment. New research techniques, such as genome-wide association studies and biobanks, have been developed to study these diseases, which may, one day, lead to more personalised healthcare. The UK's leading experts in the field of genetics, medicine and ethics have come together to discuss the implications of these genomic research projects. At the table is Steve Jones, Professor of Genetics, Jane Worthington, Professor of Chronic Disease Genetics, Diane Donai, Professor of Medical Genetics, and John Harris, Director for the Institute for Science, Ethics and Innovation. Chairing the meeting is Ralph Levinson, Senior Lecturer in Science Education. Like it or not, everybody in the end is going to have their DNA sequenced. Now, that is going to change things, and I'm not sure we've really begun to think through what to do about it. The clinic's going to be full of a worried well. People are perfectly healthy, but realise that they're going to die of something. Well, I have news for them. We're all going to die of something. We mustn't look at genes as giving us the answer. There isn't one answer. There are a number of disorders that if you inherit a gene that's got a mutation in it, you will develop a disorder. And that does affect many thousands of people. But as far as the predispositions or common diseases are concerned, we mustn't just limit ourselves to thinking about the genes. There's clearly an interplay between genes and a whole host of environmental factors, some under our own control and some not under our control. And I think the future of medicine, it's not seeing genetics as a be-all and end-all and no. answer to everything. It's seeing it as part of a large picture. And it's actually putting things together in very complex models, probably. But it's part of the useful information. And I guess it's some of the newest information that we're gaining, which makes it kind of exciting. I think also we have to think about genetics and drugs themselves, the whole science of pharmacogenetics, where um, how a person's body regardless of their disease, how a person's body metabolises a particular disease, a, a, a drug, may vary considerably. So there may be some people who metabolise it quickly and they need higher doses. There may be some people who metabolise it very slowly and thus the normal dose might actually be very toxic in that individual. Genetic information in particular is in principle knowable by anybody. So that, for example, if I take a sip of my glass and I'm imprudent enough to leave the glass on the table and you were curious enough, uh, you could take away that glass, probably get enough of my DNA from it to run my whole genome and know everything about me that is knowable from genes. And that means that because this information is in principle obtainable and very difficult to stop determined people from obtaining it. It seems to me that we have to move from the conventions of keeping things private to identifying what might be wrongful use of genetic information and having as a society the courage to determine what wrongful use is and to punish it. People often send the material off to be tested and they get advice back that says, oh, you should drink less, you shouldn't smoke, you should lose weight. Well, that's true for everybody. That's free. Absolutely. So these, these health um, risks, which we all face, genetics is, if not irrelevant, it's only a small part of the story. The more you know about, about your nature, your genetics, the more important your nurture, your environment seems to be. And that's particularly important in things like heart disease, where some people really are at high genetic risk for heart disease. So really, genetics is just reminding us, really, rather surprisingly, how much most of us are in control of our destiny, not how much our destiny controls us. I think it's also quite helpful to distinguish between genetic information that's associated with certain outcome and genetic information that's associated with risk. So yes. if you collect the right, yeah. genetic, if you're the right genetic sample, as John says, we could identify him with certainty as the person who drank from that glass. Mm. 
However, if we tested him for variants that are associated with a disease like heart disease, we could say, well, he has an increased risk of developing heart disease, but we can't say with certainty that will happen to him. So mm. I think that's an important distinction. You can see people's differences. People can observe things within their families. It's, it's part of the human condition. Yeah, doctors have always mm. taken a family history. Yes. If you yes. walk into a doctor's surgery, a physician, will, she or he, will tell you with about an 80% accuracy how long you've got to live within a minute. There's an obvious question, how old are you? Okay, that's pretty important. <laughs> yeah. um, are you male or female? Women yeah. live longer than men. Are you overweight? Do you smoke? Do you drink to excess? What's your blood pressure? What did your parents die? What's your postcode? A 15-year difference in life expectancy in Britain by postcode. Now, all these things are really strong predictors of your future, and we accept them. Mm. But somehow there's something terrifying about this little twisted molecule, and I can never understand that. That is a practising doctor. What I fear um, is that if these so-called predictive tests, which aren't actually that predictive, are extremely widely available, and people get their printouts back and bits of information there. Very often there may be things in there that actually do worry them. And then they want to go and talk to somebody about what it all means. Absolutely. And should my clinics be full of those people, or should it be full of people who have got a very significant risk of a genetic disorder, whether we can actually yeah. offer um, a, a, a more appropriate service for somebody who's much higher yeah. at risk? Everything is about to change. We've, we've heard a lot about what we call this genome-wide association study, which is really needle in a haystack stuff. I mean, now and again you're going to find a needle, but most of it's going to be haystack. But now everything has just revolutionised. It took 15 years and hundreds of scientists to sequence the first complete length of human DNA. Now, in plenty of places, you can do two in a day. In 10 years, I wouldn't be surprised if you can do two in 10 minutes. What we can offer families with genetic disorders is now enormously greater. But we still haven't quite got to the stage where there's a big application of genetic knowledge to the big common disorders of our society, like heart disease, diabetes, etc. The more we understand about medicine, not just about genetics, but about all sorts of causes of disease, the more we can see that they are, to a larger and larger extent, the responsibility of we who become ill. Um, either we have made poor lifestyle choices, or we have poor diet, or we don't take enough exercise, or we don't take prudent measures that are available to protect ourselves from disease like vaccination and so on. Jane Worthington, you've, you're one of the fruits of, the, uh, of genomics, is your particular research into genome-wide association studies. I think when we began genome-wide association studies, we knew that these uh, common or complex diseases were a manifestation of a combination of genetics and environmental factors. But actually, we didn't really have much idea about the number of genetic factors that might be important. We speculated it might be a few. Actually, as a result of doing genome-wide association studies, we've come to realise that the number of genetic loci involved in such diseases is quite varied. So the difficulties come in actually interpreting the results that we find. The genetics is hinting as to what to do next. And it's worth remembering that one of the great simple diseases of the 19th century was called fever. And if you had fever, it was straightforward. You were too hot, and what did you do? You either soaked them in cold water, or you took out a couple of pints of blood, and they probably died. Well, you now know that fever is a symptom. It's hundreds of diseases. And I think that's what genetics is doing to our view of disease as a whole. Diane, storing genetic information for the future biobanks, what should we be concerned about? We have to say, well, what are... What are biobanks storing? It's not just they're storing a sample of someone's DNA. There may be other body fluids, like urine, for example. But also, they're, study, they're storing information. Um, and what it's all aimed at is trying to understand the complexities of diseases. What contribution do genes actually make? What contributions to other factors, such as lifestyle, age, uh, um, and uh, social class play? And so I think we're looking at it as, an, uh, as, a, as a resource that then can be used in research. Where Biobank has something different and unique is that actually we're collecting samples from people um, before, often before they go on to develop a disease. And it's an opportunity to look at other factors, 
So I think biobanks are a fantastic resource, but actually I think it has the potential or offers us the potential to address different questions. Yeah. Often it's only as techniques develop that you realise realize exactly what type of sample you yeah. need or exactly yeah. how it needs to be collected. Or exactly what you're going to do with it. And, and, exactly, yes. And that actually triggers one of the very interesting things to me as an ethicist about Biobank. Because the, in human subject research up to now, the gold standard has been informed consent. And informed consent means that you actually, in order to give that consent, you have to know exactly what in this case, your biological samples are going to be useful. Biobanks are really only going to work if uh, unforeseen things, unforeseen tests, can be carried out on these samples way down the line. With larger scale approaches, you may be doing a study focused on a particular disease, but you may well turn up finding that you weren't looking for, but is a byproduct of the whole genome approach to, to the diagnosis. And I think this will trigger, interestingly, a move from informed consent as the gold standard back towards a, a simpler for, form of consent. And I suspect that the whole basis of human subject research is going to change. Genetics we're teaching today is already fossilised. And the, the genetics we teach in five years is going to be completely different. Now, that's going to be a real problem for teachers in schools. We've already got a problem, haven't we, with Mendelian genetics. And now we've got everything coming forward with genomics. How are we going to fit that into the curriculum? I have a real stick-in-the-mud attitude to that. I would leave it out of the curriculum. I remember being really shocked about 15 years ago when PCR was really the, the in thing and it was all amazing and new teaching it to some first-year students at the University College London, and they all rolled their eyes and said, oh, we did that in school. Or they know all the latest stuff, they know all the stuff that's up on, in the eaves, but they don't know about the foundations. So I'd, I'd stick to Mendel's piece. I mean, it's a real fundamental question about what school education is for. And sorry to, character, I had to caricature your position, but I mean, one of the things perhaps it isn't for is to save you the problems of teaching the basics to your first-year students. It may be actually uh, more important for people who are not going to go into uh, to higher education at all to know actually about the things that they're going to hear about on the news and, and mm. that are, people are going to want to talk to them about than the basics of uh, Mendel and his peas. If you stick to Mendel's peas, how are students going to know about the sheer fascination of being a scientist, a healthcare scientist, someone involved with genetics, somebody involved in genetic research? But if things are changing so quickly, then isn't, doesn't there come a point where it might not be important to teach them about what is changing? Because what is changing is going to change dramatically in the next five years. So isn't it about expecting the change rather than teaching the content? I think it's, it's very good to, uh, to have educational processes that anticipate change and get people used to thinking about options before they happen. But of course, the curriculum is a crowded place and mm. many different interests are, uh, are being served there.